Welcome to the Not in the Job Description podcast. I'm Scott McLaughlin. And I'm Chris Kiernan. No matter what type of job you've had, there were situations that happened to you during work that you couldn't wait to tell your friends about. We interview a variety of guests about some of their crazy stories from work, from entry-level food service industry jobs to doctors and attorneys. We will explore funny, gross, embarrassing, scary, and sometimes almost unbelievable stories that people have experienced while on the job. Keep in mind that our guests or the companies they work for may be masked in order to protect the innocent, or maybe even the guilty. Today's show, we're speaking to Jen, who's worked in the tattoo and piercing industry. Welcome, Jen. Good morning or afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever time it is. Whatever Good that time. time. It is in your yeah. world. Well, thanks for joining us today. Um, I have a ton of questions, and, and I'm sure Chris does too, because Chris, I mean, we know each other pretty well. You have any tattoos? I do not. I do not have any tattoos. I came close once, but never pulled the trigger. Yeah. Do you guys want to get one? Uh, you can talk us into it through the episode <laughs> if you'd like. I don't have any tattoos because I was always afraid of what it would look like. Because I would have been that idiot who got like Night Ranger tattoo or something. <laughs> and it would be some obscure band or something. Um, so I never got a tattoo. Certainly no piercings. I don't think there's popular with dudes. I know they do it, but I don't think it's... My ear was pierced, but of course that was oh, right. the late 80s, early 90s when guys pierced their left ear and that was it right yeah right that's when it was something now it's just right. ornamentation i mean you right, see people right. pierced all over the place so um tell us jen what kind of business did you work in like what did they do um i worked in a an independent tattoo shop on ohio state campus here in columbus okay so you yeah. probably had uh, a whole lot of people in their early teens early 20 years making all kinds of decisions <laughs> All the time there, huh? Yeah. Um, my job title was a cross between like mother, big sister, bossy, <laughs> <laughs> bossy nurturer. I guess, guess which is kind of like being a mom. <laughs> but yeah, it was, yeah, it was, um, it was an awesome, but like crazy experience. Well, that's cool. Did, did, uh, I mean, what, what's the schedule look like there? I mean, is it something where people will just walk in and go, show me what you got? Or how many of them come in and say, I'd like to have mom right here? I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always curious, is it busy or is it more of a walk-in thing or schedule thing? When I worked in the industry, there were not, a, there were not a, as many studios as there are now. There were maybe two to three other reputable tattoo and piercing shops in Columbus. So we were quite busy piercings, which I took care of, were all walk-in. The tattoos were scheduled, and we did all custom artwork, so we really, you know, unlike many other shops where people would walk in and pick what's called flash or mm -hmm. already existing artwork, like out of a book or off a wall, we, we were all CCAD graduates or students, and so we did all custom work, and we wanted people to permanently mark their bodies with art that really meant something to them in some way. Or certainly more of one of a kind versus, yeah. you know, you're down at Ohio State at the game and you yeah. see somebody with the exact same tattoo. <laughs> yeah, nothing against the Buckeyes because we were in Buckeye country, mm -hmm. um, like where the shop was, but um, we did not tattoo Buckeyes. We, you know, it was like if we did an Ohio State tattoo, it was... Like it was in the person's DNA, you know, right. but even then we would dig in and like, how can we make this your own right. and not just the logo or. Are there any licensing agreements or issues with that? If you're like going to put a big block O on somebody? Uh, you don't have to answer I, that if I you're going to be in legal so. trouble now. No, I mean, <laughs> it was free marketing for them. And, um, you know, OSU is kind of a. Uh, it, you know, it's a brand itself, so right. like the kids were branding themselves. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I would have been, been the Literally. one that got Penn State, big Joe Paw, and then regretted it. <laughs> <laughs> well, since it was so custom, then, I mean, can you think of, like, one of the coolest tattoos, maybe, that you guys put together from for somebody? Oh, my God. Um, we did memorial pieces. We would, like, 
use MC Escher as that's cool as inspiration for a piece that would wrap around someone's arm and be thicker lines at the top and gradiate down their arm. One of my favorite pieces that, like, as soon as you asked that question, that came to mind is I designed this big fairy that went on this young lady's back. And, you know, at the time we were often, like, you know, out at clubs and dancing and socializing, and I saw it dancing. (laughs) Like, literally from across the room, and I'm like, oh, my God. It's the fairy. Right, right. <laughs> that could have been the E as well. So. No. <laughs> no, I saved that for the woods. Oh, okay. Very good. <laughs> Silly me. That's why I do it as well. Um, well, you know, you, you talk about tattoos and again, mm-hmm. never had one. I would be the, and I love art, but yeah, I, I know I would just regret it in so, no time at all. But have you had people that have had some work done at the shop you worked at that weren't happy with what they got or had some regrets? There Now, like for clarity, I did not perform the tattoos. I would help design them, and then I performed piercings okay. and whatnot. But there, there was an, an experience where one of the tattoo artists had been working with someone on a design, and... It was a number of hours into conversation and working through the artwork. They scheduled time. It was a busy day. The kid came in. Like, literally, the tattoo artist is about to put, like, needle to skin, which is forever. And the kid's like, I don't, you know, I don't know, like, how can we make this different? Or change? Mm. And, you know, and, like, the tattoo artist was like, what like (laughs) you know and it's not so much like the waste of time but just like why are you waiting like what what came out now yeah Yeah. and um we thought we had a good filtering system to like dig in and you know ask the right questions to make sure that the person knew what they wanted like yeah if someone came in and wanted a butterfly tattoo we would basically like lay down the butterfly bible that had 2500 like different butterflies and then okay so that's the outline that's the shape of the wings that's the pattern but what colors do you want like yeah it was you know it was like pretty detailed yeah Um, there was like consultation (laughs) but you know what i'd be the exact wrong person to give that to because i'd be like yeah Yeah. just show me something that looks cool and i'll go with that i'm the same way with You know, if if my wife and I are looking at furniture or something or, hey, what are we going to do this room? All I need is show me 50 rooms that are already done and I'll tell you which one I like. I cannot put together bits and pieces. So that would be a nightmare for me. But I think if you're getting a tattoo, you would want that kind of input if it's going to be on your body. Yeah, it was our hope that um, that there'd be appreciation for our care in what was permanently being marked on their bodies. Yeah, I'm always amazed to... um, Again, I feel like Grandpa Scott when I talk about this stuff. But I'm always amazed when I was little, the only tattoos you would see, uh, it was because somebody was either in the military or in prison. I mean, it was those kind of things. You either had U.S. Marine Corps or every now and then you'd have that mom or something like that. And some of those were done in prison too. But um, that's all it was. (laughs) Now it seems like everybody has tattoos. I've seen people you know, in their 80s with tattoos. And I see people now yes. who there's no way they're of legal age and they have tattoos. Yeah. Yeah. I, when I was working in the industry, like I'm from a, a small town and, you know, I'd go home to visit my mom and my grandmother and I'm out and about like literally holding my grandmother's arm and, you know, like we're giggling and a woman walked by us with her child and literally grasped her child to her. <laughs> Like I was going to murder her child. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm hanging out with my mom and my grams. Like, yeah, but I heard your grandma looks a little shady. Oh, I'm just she's saying. She's ornery. <laughs> oh, like she was the one anyone would have had to worry about. <laughs> well, you know, in doing some research for the show, according to a 2019 poll, which I'm sure this is way outdated, but mm-hmm. according to a 2019 poll by Ipsos, 30% of all Americans, regardless of age, have at least one tattoo. Yeah, I bet that's higher now. I'll bet it's way higher. Uh, just over the past few years, it seems like, I mean, seriously, if you walk through the grocery store, and we're in a kind of a, 
I don't know, more of a conservative type of town, you can walk through a grocery store and it's way more than 30%. You can see tattoos on people. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and, and I think and piercings, yeah. right? And I just think it's a lot more acceptable, I guess, by society standards. Like when you were mentioning, you know, back in the day, walking with your your mom and grandmother, people were kind of taken aback. Well, now you don't even bat an eye at it. You know, you'll right. see, Mm-mm. you'll see, you know, like the kindergarten mom dropping her daughter mm-hmm. off with a full sleeve tattoo, and it just looks like it was mm-hmm. meant to be, right? It just doesn't seem to be mm-hmm. maybe the stigma or the weirdness like it yeah. used to be. And now mom and grandma have tattoos. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Well, back when you started and it wasn't quite as acceptable back then, I, I guess maybe not acceptable is not the right word, but it just wasn't quite as common. Were there times that people walked in the door and you're like, whoa, I can't believe this person's coming in for a tattoo or a piercing, like just yeah. totally off the wall, like someone you would never expect to walk in the door? Absolutely. There's two clients that I'm thinking of and one, her first tattoo for her 80th birthday. Oh, wow. And the second was a, like a lawyer. Okay. Um, and he would come in in three piece suits mm-hmm. and like he'd call ahead because he, he's a busy man and he'd come in. I'd shut the doors. Other customers thought he was my dad. <laughs> um, and, you know, so he's in suits all day and the gentleman had very, very large gauge genital jewelry. Oh, um, OK. And on one of those visits, it was to replace a a threaded ball. So it's a ball that has threads and screws into the jewelry because he was in front of a judge speaking on a court case. And the ball basically had loosened, dropped (laughs) on the floor, which like, um, like imagine a half inch diameter stainless steel ball dropping down your inseam and then rolling across the floor. Oh, wow. I hope he was quick enough to go, hole in my pocket. Um, You know, and he just, he said he just, because I, that was my question. Like, what did you do? Like, what happened? And he's like, he continued with his, his conversation, walked over to the ball where the ball was and just, you know, discreetly bent down to pick it up and put it in his pocket. And then, you know, came to see me. <laughs> well, in, in fairness, though, here, right? Afterwards. I, I don't think he needed to act embarrassed because nobody in that courtroom is thinking, oh, that just fell off of his scrotum. There's <laughs> nobody yeah. thinking that. No. Oh, no. my God. I mean, I, who knows? Who knows? The judge might have been like, oh, that happened to me last week. <laughs> right. You yeah. never, never know. Yeah. They, I mean, they because, might hang out in the same clubs. Right? I mean, I learned piercing from a reconstructive surgeon and she traveled the world teaching her like suturing techniques. She worked, she was an administrator. She had her own practice. She did pro bono work. She worked in ER at one of our local hospitals. She was a badass and that's who I learned this from. (laughs) Well, And that's kind of smart. There's a lot of overlap. I mean, you're just dealing Mm -hmm. with people's skin and if you're in the ER, you're constantly suturing people up. So there's a great overlap there of how to treat the skin when you're going to pierce it. Yeah. Yeah. Which brings us to piercings. (laughs) We were going to come up to this. Uh, and, And when I was doing some research on piercings, and again, this is from 2017, so who knows what's happened. Ages ago. That that might as well have been 50 years ago. I know. But uh, there was COVID and everything changed. Oh, I'm quite sure people, now that they didn't have to go into the office, uh, I'm quite sure it went crazy with piercings and tattoos. But according to uh, Statista.com, it's kind of interesting. They talked about areas that are pierced. Yeah. What do you think the number one place for piercings and you know, on the body? Your ears, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a million body parts. Right. Mm-hmm. So earlobes, 77%. Ears. Uh, then ears, you know, the, like the top and the cartilage area. Yeah. Ears. There's all the like inner and outer helixes and traguses mm-hmm. and yeah. The next thing was uh, the tongue mm-hmm. at 19%. Mm-hmm. I guess it shouldn't surprise me, but damn, that just feels... I mean, I. I couldn't imagine. I bet the pain's got to be. No. Really? It's, it's, it, that's actually one of the easier piercings. The care for it afterwards, because it's a muscle. Right. Um, it will swell and you talk funny for a couple days, but otherwise it's one of the easier, but it also heals really fast. So it's yeah. one of the easier piercings to receive. 
you know, maybe it's because it's my age group. I used to see a lot more people with their tongue pierced. I don't think I don't see that as much now. So yeah. maybe piercing like yeah. you probably don't see people of that age anymore. Go. I mean, I try, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't pay enough to see people of that age anymore. True, true. Um, the next thing item or is, is as far as area that's pierced is navel. And that's pretty big. Oh, yeah. You see that all. I, I'm surprised that's not above tongue, but it's tied with tongue at 19. Yeah. I've pierced that's a tongue twister too. Thousands, thousands of belly buttons. Uh, nasal wing. Yeah. Nose. Yeah. I see that a lot too. That's at eighteen yeah. percent. Um, on your face, lip. I see a lot of that too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's only fifteen percent. And then I was a little surprised. The next one's nipple. Yeah. At thirteen percent. Yeah. Again, you would not believe the people that would come in for um, nipple piercings, men and women. Yeah, and, and not just like regular fourteen gauge, but like again, both men and women that would come in and want what, barbells, like <laughs> barbells or rings. Yeah, that is crazy. Or or we pierce them and stretch them to be able to put thicker jewelry in. I just have to take that in for a second. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, nipple actually beats the next one, which I see a lot of too. And of course, people aren't walking around topless all the time, but eyebrow. I see a lot of eyebrow piercings, mm-hmm. uh, followed by just the general term genital, mm-hmm. then nasal septum, which does not, uh, I mean, I know people like that bowl look. Mm-hmm. That seems like it would hurt, but I don't know. It's a tender one. There are a lot of nerves and I make everyone cry. Oh, well, and that settles it. I'm not getting it. I was going to, but now I'm not. Yeah. Um, dimple and cheek. Yeah. I've only seen... Uh, there's only one person I know that she, she worked for me at one time and she had dimple piercings. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I like those. They're cute. And that was 5%. Uh, and then finally, labia. Yeah, which are genital piercings. They, they yeah. specified this for whatever reason, at labia at 1%. Yeah. Does 1% sound about right for you, <laughs> having been in the business? Yeah, it's lower. Like I'd say um, more women would have like their a hood piercing, which is the tissue above the clitoris. Yeah. Like that would is was more I did more piercings of that than the actual labias. But um, since I don't have those parts, mm-hmm. they all sound painful to me. Is you think one yeah. would be worse than the other? Is that? N- no, I mean, like, I mean, there are a lot of nerves in that in that part of our body, which is why genitals can be so enjoyable for people. The piercing itself can be more sensitive, but again, there's a lot of blood flow, so it heals quickly, but it's never, it's never really deterred anyone. Yeah. uh, I can tell you, I I get that they can be in sensitive area. Never once have I thought, you know what? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's just not my thing. That just scares the hell out of me. In fact, I would mm-hmm. say I try to keep sharp instruments away from those areas. Yeah. But I guess it's it's pretty common. Um, yeah. But that that is surprising. I mean, when, when you talk about people that get tattoos and piercings, uh, tattoos, you're kind of stuck with it if you don't like it. Piercings, mm-hmm. did you have a lot of people that come through and say, you know what, on second thought, can we just get this removed? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes it was like, you know, we would do the piercing and they're and that day they're like, oh, I mean, it looks good, but I'm just not feeling it. I'm like, all right, like you want to take it out now? You want to go home, live with it for a minute? Sometimes it was a year later, five years later. That's funny. I mean, Somebody that's, would go through all that to have a, a very interesting part of their body that was probably very painful to have it done. And then go, you know what, on second thought, just go ahead and take it out. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is, is that like, I don't think anyone goes into body modification thinking about the pain. Like once they sit in the chair, yeah, they may get some nervousness, but there's usually a reason behind it. Like there's a life experience that drives them into like taking action on this. And I don't know, for me, that was always the beauty of it is Like for some people, it was, I'm independent, I'm on my own, I'm doing this to my body. For other people, it was a healing experience or like a memorial to help with grief. 
or because they got divorced, because they got married, because they had babies, like, and working in the industry, like, that was, like, so magical to be part of people's lives like that. Yeah, kind of new beginnings, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, like, we would talk about, like, pain, but, like, I kind of had a process of, like, breathing techniques that would calm them down and, and hopefully make the process a lot smoother for them. But I, th- I think like when they would stay focused on their reason for getting it or, mm-hmm. or just how great it was going to look like pain wasn't really a, f- a big factor in the conversation. So was there a certain type of person that came in that you just knew, like from looking at them um, from past experience, like, Oh, this person's going to be the biggest wimp. I can already tell. Like, <laughs> You know, like the 18 year old boy or the, uh, and, and I, here's why I said a frame of reference, um, a, a friend of mine that's um, a recovery room nurse. She always says yeah. that it's the young males that are the biggest wimps coming out of anesthesia and the 80 year old grandma takes it like a champ. So did you kind of see that with things that were going to be painful? Like just certain people fit a mold that you're like, oh, this guy's going to cry like a baby. I would, I wouldn't call them wimps. Everyone had a different experience. But like, because I saw so many people that came in and out of the shop, some of my coworkers and I would, it became like personal challenges as they walked in the door within the first five seconds to know whether they needed nurtured, they needed us to give them some shit and harass them and and build banter. But usually the bigger guys, because they had, you know, they're big. So they got to put on this front that they're like big and tough. They were always the ones to pass out on me. (laughs) And, and I could see it coming. Like I know, I know that like I know the physiology and the anatomy and how the face drains and the color goes out of this, the lips. And I'm like kind of waving to a coworker to get me (laughs) some water and, (laughs) and get ready to catch um, this dude. Yeah. yeah, uh, Yes. On many occasions. And you know, I'm five two and I'm thinking of one particular gentleman that was like, I don't know, six, two, six, four, two, twenty. And, and I was like, you know, I can see you're, you're losing a little color. Like I'm getting, I have some water. He's like, no, I'm fine. And I'm like, you know, I just, I, I, this is what I do. Just let give me a minute to like, take care of you. And he's like, no. And he starts to stand up. And I was like, I'd really like you to stay in this seat, you know? And I had to get firm with him, you know, like bring out the mom voice and like, <laughs> I told you to sit down. The guy stands up as soon as he like reaches his full heights, I'm grabbing the back of his head oh. and trying to guide him to the floor. And he lands on top of me, like, <laughs> like literally <laughs> like I'm holding a baby <laughs> and he wakes up and I'm just like, hi, welcome back. Oh man! <laughs> and listen, Chris, uh, well, I, I do know people I've got, my wife's family has some people, if they see blood, they'll pass oh, out. Yeah. And that, that yeah. always kind of cracks me up because that that's just so extreme to me. But Chris, you can't call anyone a wimp who's going to have a piercing through their scrotum. Well, good point. (laughs) I mean, scrotum's nothing. That's like thin tissue. Like there are not. Oh, are you going to tell me about how the scrotum feels like? And you think you're going to know better than me? Um, (laughs) I, it's thin elastic tissue that doesn't have as much nerves in it as the actual penis. Now I get it there are some sensitive piercings. Oh, you would and have to I, knock me out. Yeah. There's just and, no way. And it's likely I would. Yeah. Like I like if I'm if a gentleman's gonna pass out, it's generally from a one of those piercings. Anybody and, ever have that area tattooed? Yeah. Yeah. It seems a little extreme to me as well. Yeah. yeah. That's it's, just I don't know. Yeah. Again, probably our age, you know, Chris and I, we, we, we don't yeah. see a lot of these things with friends and everything that we know, but mm-hmm. I'm just amazed at how many people still, you know, go out and have these things done. And I'm also, you know, the, the regretful stories. I don't know if you've ever gone on Pinterest or any of these places where they talk about, you know, reg- regrets, no. literally no regards, no regards, <laughs> uh, where people mm-hmm. make mistakes on the tattoos and everything. But I was looking at Buzzfeed and um, they had DIY tattoos that look horrible over time. Oh, my God. I mean, that will, yes. you start showing those to people, and we will clear up anybody having tattoos because some of them are heinous. Yeah. Um, one person said they got a matching star tattoo with their brother's girlfriend. 
who two days later said she's been cheating on the brother, can't stand the family, and left. Oh, boy. <laughs> so she's got this tattoo of a star on her foot that she showed. And then one of my favorite ones, and this 100% would have been me if I got a tattoo when I was young. This person got an insane clown posse tattoo when they were 17. Mm. <laughs> and they said 20 years later, it's a reminder of just how stupid they are. And it looked pretty dumb. Yeah, but you know what? It is a a life mark that continually reminds them to make smarter decisions. That is a good way to look That's at it. That's yeah. the spin right yeah. there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, I mean, we, we had clients that at one point were straight edge or have been straight edge their whole life. And then at 40, you know, are no longer straight edge either. And, you know, but the tattoos are still there. And it's like, that's like, I don't know, for me, the beauty of tattoos and piercing is they kind of mark moments in your life. Back in the day, there were cave paintings and primitive people mark their bodies to like demark moments in life. You know, at the, I don't know. I could go down a whole rabbit hole of how piercing and tattooing are like in our DNA to want to belong to a tribe and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But anyway. No, that makes, <laughs> that makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, they, I'm into looking at all kinds of things on the Internet and you'll see sometimes they'll find a body and it's been in permafrost and it's 20,000 years old yeah. and it's tattooed. So it's obvious that this is something that. You know, I think art is something that's just very human in nature. And I think it's the, uh, you know, you don't see even monkeys making art. You, you'll see human beings making art. So it doesn't surprise me. It's all over people's bodies and has been for a very long time. Yeah. On some of these tattoos also, you know, you're talking about like bad tattoos or um, on your thing there. I kind of have always wondered when people get like Chinese writing and things. Does it really mean something, or is it just like General Tso's chicken with yeah, fried rice? Yeah, do you have a spell I mean, check or something on that? Um, I do not know how to read Chinese script, and when we did get those requests, it was like, go to the Chinese. We're at OSU. Go to the Chinese department. Go to the Japanese department. Like, if you're going to get this tattooed on your body, make sure you know what it is, because we did not do any tattoos like that that we were aware of but we did cover up oh yeah tattoos <laughs> that's even a better story they thought they were getting something and they would run out run into someone out in the world that could read it and like why does it say this <laughs> why do you have dip shit across your chest <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah uh, yeah anyway that's a, another rabbit hole <laughs> <laughs> so along the um, same lines of, of people that have issues or, or, or want to put a tattoo on are there times when you just flat out say no we're not going to do that. yes absolutely please expand on that um number one osu would have game days um where there's drinking from eight in the morning um there was a duration where we started closing the shop on saturdays um because it was a full day of drunk individuals suddenly wanting tattoos or um, that's not the environment we wanted to work. You know, we're artists. We want to be proud of the work that we do, but we also want the person receiving it to enjoy the work. Well, I want to give you the flip side. You're depriving them of that opportunity of making better decisions in the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. You know, like, and we always made sure they knew they were welcome to come back when they're sober and when they're not like partying all day and then going to be out in the world like you know you got you got to care for it afterwards you need to hydrate you know is there ever any situation where it was a sober person and they wanted something and you were just like you know what we're we're not we're just not going to do that for you um maybe because it was too offensive or just you know, I don't know, whatever the reason might be. Yeah, like getting people's names tattooed was a, th- a big thing, um, still is. And unless it was a memorial piece, mm-hmm. your kid's names, your dog or cat's name, you know, like we just, we didn't do it because people can get divorced. So Lock- the girl I met at the game, Sally, you wouldn't let me no. tattoo? Oh, really? Okay. No. 
That's but, future business you're turning down, you know. That's okay. We had a line <laughs> out the door. Um, but what is it about Sally that you loved? Like, how could you represent those feelings by an illustration or by, like, how else can you express that? See, and that's why she's the professional right there, right? That's right. That's right. Now, George Carlin in his book talked about, you know, people making <laughs> mistakes. And he was a genius. And he said, you know, a lot of people will spend hundreds, if not thousands of dollars covering up a tattoo because you had Sally put on your arm. But instead, just spend a hundred and have fuck Sally put on your arm. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was genius. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the business you guys missed out on. But that's okay. Yeah. Uh, speaking we were, of. But see, that's the thing. Tattooing, like the at the point that we were coming into the tattoo industry, up or up until that point, it was a craft. Yeah, right. Or, um, you know, kind of like how there's, uh, I don't want to say like drywallers or, you know, like it's you learn a skill and you do it. Like we're, we came out of a design school and. It was, for us, it was about making art every day and not going into a corporate job right away sure. or, you know, being our own bosses and loving the work that we did. And, and like one of my best friends at the time was, um, was the owner. So like he set a lot of these standards. He's like, we're not doing this stuff. And that's probably you know, pretty smart because, you know, he probably learned a lot of that stuff. Because what he had seen in the past through trial and error. I mean, it's got to be yeah. horrible when you have somebody come back and, you know, they're unhappy. And it's not because of the work necessarily you did, but mm -hmm. their motivation for having something done. That's got to be kind of sad. Yeah. So, you know, you're almost artist and and therapist figuring out, like, what's the rationale behind this and how oh, can we help absolutely. you? Yeah. Now, you brought up, you know, the person that owned the business. And, you know, I didn't go to art school um, the kind of business I'm in was just more business and banking and everything like that. And you sat down and you did the job and it was pretty well structured. But when it comes to art, a lot of it has to do with actually going in and doing it and over time experiencing what it's like and seeing the good and the bad. But you had to have some pretty good teachers. You'd mentioned that you had a doctor. Um, can you tell us more about like how you got into the piercing side? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was kind of like just present, I mean, presented to me. It's not like I grew up wanting to be a piercer. Um, I went to CCD and studied industrial design, which is 3D design and the use of many different materials. So kind of like a creative engineer. When I learned that they were looking for a piercer at the studio, like one of the other tattoo artists was like, Jen, you should come work for, come work with us. And to me, it was just another material to learn to, yeah. to get mm -hmm. creative with. And once I learned many of the more traditional piercings, um, the doctor that helped the owner prep the business plan and open mm -hmm. the studio and taught us, um, unlike a lot of other shops that would just create a clean space for piercings like I was actually using sterile glove like a sterile technique right so surgical gloves I was using IV catheters rather than um archaic piercing needles that like cut the skin in a way that it had slower healing and blah 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 it was just more about you you learn from a doctor and yeah so you learned suturing techniques and you learned things yeah. that probably helped you to deliver a better experience. Yeah. The the piercings healed more quickly, created less trauma. The catheters have a sleeve over them. So once I did the piercing, the needle would be removed right away. Um, unlike traditional piercing where the needle was left in and then you had to follow the jewelry through the piercing with the jewelry. I, with the catheter, I was able to put the jewelry inside the sleeve of the catheter and pull it right back out. So like there was less drag through the piercing, um, less possibility of losing the jewelry as you bring it back through the piercing. Um, it was super smooth. You know, everything was sterile. It, it was awesome. And yeah, like 
having learned from a surgeon, it really kind of set us apart and made individuals feel more confident in coming in and talking to us, made parents feel more confident. <laughs> right. You know, if they are, you know, if their kid was, um, if they were bringing, you know, someone under 18 in, and a lot of times they themselves would end up back getting some sort of work. My parents didn't even buy me a bicycle. I'm sorry. So Yeah, it was bad. Horrible, mm-hmm. horrible childhood. <laughs> but uh, are there parents who take their kids there to get tattoos? Like, yeah. what's, what's the earliest age that you're even allowed to tattoo somebody? I mean, two? No, I'm oh. kidding. <laughs> I mean, but parents also buy their kids iPhones and iPads. I'm guilty of that. You know, like... It's, it's kind of like, it's, I don't know that like there's, depending on where you're growing up or whatever, it's kind of part of societal norms or, um, you know, like, do you want your kids to be doing the same thing as all the other kids? I mean, I kind of ended up where I was because my mom was like, why do you have to do what all the other kids do? Be your own person. And now she's kicking herself because she's like, (laughs) why can't you be like everybody else? Well, an iPhone doesn't turn into a fuck Sally tattoo in a couple (laughs) years. So I'll give you that. No, but that's why the parents are involved in the consultation process. And like, we try to stay, we would try to stay, you know, we would hear what the client wanted. Like the kid was the client. What is it they want? Why are they getting it? But mom, how does this sound to you? Or dad, how does this sound to you? And we had clients as young as, for tattooing, probably 15, 16 years old with their parents' consent. I pierced a couple um, friends. I pierced a couple of their kids that were as young as six or eight, like they're like earlobe piercings. Yeah. I don't know why I'm that surprised about it because there yeah. are kids, they're babies that get their ears mm-hmm. pierced. There's just something about it. Yeah. Like here's my 13 year old daughter, Tangere. Would you put a piercing in her belly button? Yeah. I don't know. That just seems weird to me. That's, that's, I, I agree. That's kind of young. Yeah. So but, I don't even know if you can answer this question because you know, you, it, it's kind of one of those things where you're kind of in it. So to you, it's just a normal day in the business. But to Chris and I, we're like, oh my gosh, what happened? <laughs> so what, what, what are some of the, I won't say extreme, but more unusual things that parents have asked you to do to kids? It's not so much the parents asking us to do it. It's the kids, kids asking wanting for it. it. And parents and giving the, parents the okay. And the parents legally would have to be there. God, my parents sucked. But go on. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, it w- it was simpler stuff. Um, oh my goodness. Probably like there was a brother and sister that would come into the shop. Like they were 15 and 17 years old and their dad came in with them to sign off on tattoos for them. Like, honestly, I can't tell you what the tattoos were, but the brother and sister, they were just like, their personalities, like they, they just knew who they were at such a young age and what they wanted. And like their dad was behind it. And like, I'm still friends with the brother and he's a super cool guy. Like I can't say kid anymore. Right. Um, Cause he's like in his forties, <laughs> but like, I don't know. It was like, I remember more the interaction. I can see their smiles standing, like, on the other side of the counter, like, kind of bouncing out up and down out of excitement. And it was just this, like, we want to do this together. Like, this bonding between them. And, you know, they're still really tight. And I don't know. Like, it's, I don't for from my perspective, it was more about that moment than the work that they got. Because I honestly, yeah. I can't remember what tattoo either of them got. But you remember the feelings involved. In, oh, in yeah, 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 yeah. It and makes I, me warm and fuzzy. Well, that's good. Yeah. And, and I'm sure that, you know, that's something that they'll remember and that'll kind of be between them forever. So, yeah, that's nice because, you know, I don't even know that I go to dinner with my sisters twice a year. So. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, um, as we're rounding up the episode here, I have to ask, Chris, what'd you learn? 
Yeah, I learned that I need to be prepared to pass out when I get my genitals pierced. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of along the same lines, I learned that uh, it's probably good practice to replace those scrotal piercings every now and then just to make sure they don't fall out during work meetings. Yeah. Yeah. If good you idea. have jewelry with balls, like make sure your balls are tight. That's what my grandma always <laughs> used to say. That's yeah. Good. All right. Well, thank you. That about wraps it up for this episode. I'm Scott McLaughlin. I'm Chris Kiernan. We'll see you at work. Thank you for listening to the Not in the Job Description podcast. If you have a story you'd like to share, or if you'd like to be a guest on our podcast, please let us know by sending us an email with a brief description of your story to stories at notinthejob.com.